Okay, so I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to uh, introduce the panel members and then um, um, flash up a, a list of questions that uh, we've come up with to guide a discussion. But the idea is to not have this uh, be a panel that talks at you, but I want people in the audience to participate and ask questions and raise issues, and uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so um, we have a panel of, of five distinguished individuals who were um, uh, already involved in electromagnetic follow-up of LIGO sources and will continue to be on the scene for a while. Uh, so in alphabetical order, Lindy Blackburn, uh, Phil Copperthwaite, Mansi Kasliwal, Stephen Smart, and Marceli Sora Santos. Um, and so there are a few questions that um, I asked the panel members to, to discuss, and we'll see if we actually make it through all of them. We don't have to, but uh, let me quickly go through them. Um, so as, as the gravitational wave network uh, approaches design sensitivity, and we are going to start seeing events at 200 megaparsecs and maybe beyond, neutron star binary mergers, uh, what are the prospects for rapid electromagnetic identification? What are the prospects for EM counterpart detections uh, at wavelengths other than optical, um, which, is, which is the way 170817 was, was first identified? Um, how are we going to uh, uh, determine whether the optical and infrared emission are definitively coming from our process nucleosynthesis? What observations will have to help to distinguish off-axis relativistic jets from mildly relativistic, more isotropic outflows? Um, will measurements of the Hubble constant with binary neutron star mergers be competitive with existing techniques? Uh, what are your thoughts and plans on follow-up of binary black hole mergers, electromagnetic follow-up of binary black holes? And what are important uh, uh, issues to consider for long-term uh, follow-up in the 2020s uh, in the era of LSST and in the era of having a full gravitational wave detector network of, of perhaps five detectors um, up and running? So I'll let the uh, panel members uh, address these, uh, these questions, but uh, before we kind of jump into it, um, they each have about five minutes to um, provide their initial thoughts. So again, we'll start in alphabetical order. So I have um, just a quick list of slides of just stuff that's uh, personally interesting to me. This is by no means a comprehensive list of all the questions we can discuss or a comprehensive discussion of each question, but things worth discussing are prospects for um, Early identification, we've kind of already covered this, but um, 1717 was discovered 11 hours uh, after explosion, and that's still not early enough to constrain all of the early behavior and early possible uh, explanations for what occurs on, on even shorter time scales, even, you know, minutes, hours. So what can we do to um, be more rapid in that regard, not just, you know, these discussions we have of, of what we can get from LIGO on, on short time scales, but also as observers, how can we be prepared to use instruments and, and promptly follow up once we do get, do get events. Two is one of the questions was, you know, what are the uh, prospects for our process production identification? So um, again, you can see broad features in the near infrared spectrum. We, we sort of discussed this earlier. Um, you can see broad features in the spectrum from like near infrared spectrum from Ryan Chornock's paper, or you can see um, the spectral series from, from Mansi's paper where you, you can see this um, transition from a very blue to a very red uh, transient. And that combined with um, the behavior of the volumetric luminosity uh, is suggestive of uh, our process element production, but what else can we do? Looking ahead, can we do better? Can we be more definitive in terms of exactly what sort of elements or the distribution was produced. In terms of, of prospects for cosmology, you know, Dan Holtz uh, gave a very nice talk about this, but um, you know, one thing that we're, we're concerned about is how can you fold in better EM modeling so um, you can get a result from the luminosity distance and the redshift, but if you fold in other modeling assumptions from the radio and X-ray, what can you do to improve your measurement of H0? Does that make it easier to become more competitive with, with other methods, or does it, does it just make things more difficult because you add uh, additional model assumptions into um, your calculation? And then what can be done um, in terms of like Duncan's talk about dealing with the distance inclination degeneracy? Uh, what are the prospects for um, improving that, both by uh, how you process the GW data and also what you fold in from we know, uh, what we know from electromagnetic observations? And then lastly, um, I think the most exciting thing is, is looking ahead to the, the future when we have five detectors running in a network. 
Um, so this is a plot from a talk Leah Singer gave, I, I'm sure it's from other papers, where uh, the typical kind of localization regions in the five detector network are, are quite, quite small. So it's very easy for um, an instrument like LSST to effectively cover up and um, you know, cover these probability regions and, and really do very effective follow-up of um, these events. And I think this needs to be done in a sort of a coordinated target of opportunity method because as you can see from this paper Dan Skolnick did shortly after 7817, it's gonna be very difficult to see these just in the normal LSST Keynes data. So discussion of uh, the future of sort of target of opportunity efforts with LSST. Okay, um, so uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm going to just see four, four topics for discussion in the next five minutes and we'll see how that goes. Um, so the first topic I'd like to see for discussion is stellar evolution models for the formation of compact binary, uh, binaries that have a neutron star. We've heard a lot about different uh, evolutionary scenarios for black hole, black hole binaries, but I'd love to hear some more ideas on how compact neutron star binaries form. And uh, just as a teaser, um, very recently, we've identified an ultra-strip supernova. So supernova with only 0.2 solar masses of ejecta, which is the penultimate step before forming a compact neutron star binary. And you can see two peaks, which is again evidence of the shock cooling and a spectroscopic match to Thomas Torres and Takashi Moria's models here. Um, the second question, um, Raf gave a really nice summary of jet physics, so we can blaze through this very quickly. Um, the cool picture I wanted to show you was by graduate student Or Gottlieb, um, who's a graduate student with Udi Nakar at Tel Aviv. So this is a hydrodynamical uh, simulation of the breakout of a cocoon. Um, and you see uh, energetics on the left, kinematics on the right, and the zoom in gives you a sense of scale. And one point that I just wanted to add to uh, the very nice talk by Raf is that the breakout of the shock can actually not only explain the radio and the X-ray and the optical, but also the gamma rays. And the gamma rays in this case were offset from the gravitational waves by a couple of seconds and had two components in the spectrum and a very low luminosity. And these features are very hard to reproduce um, in any other context. So um, I'm very glad that the community has converged on this picture of uh, a cocoon and now the debate is all just on the, what the fate of the jet is and that very much is an open question here. So ideas on how to settle this with larger samples would be very uh, fun to discuss. Um, the third question that I'd like to just plan for discussion is nucleosynthesis. Um, you heard from Stefan Roswag um, that it's not even clear. I mean, we know there's our process elements. Brian and Stefan convinced you of that. Um, but we don't know whether there were all three peaks were actually synthesized. Was the heaviest peak in our process actually there? I challenge you to tell me which one is a better fit here from Stefan's paper. Um, and from Brian's paper, it seems it's, like a, it's a much complicated picture. There's a little bit of blue, a little bit of red. Um, so we could have some discussions about survey strategies and making progress on understanding these different parameters in the model, the viewing angle, the mass ratio, the remnant lifetime, uh, et cetera. And on my favorite mountain job, just one amongst many in the world, which are having fun with this event, um, I just wanted to give you a quick update that this Wiki Transient facility is now up and running. Last night we had 837,000 alerts for candidates. And uh, uh, we are also commissioning on Palomar Mountain a wide field infrared camera, which was 25 square degrees. So 42 times bigger than anything else uh, that exists right now. And discovery is only the first step. There's lots of fun to be had with follow-up, particularly multi-wavelength follow-up. And uh, multi-wavelength, Edo posed the question about multi-wavelength searches and whether they can be aided by galaxy catalogs. Um, so we can discuss this and debate this uh, till the cows come home. But uh, the main point that I'd like to, you to take away is that uh, GW170817 was the third highest priority galaxy in a rank ordered list of only 49 galaxies in the error volume of uh, uh, GW170817. And looking ahead to O3, if you focus on volumes that are less than 10 to the 4 megaparsec cube, which is about half the error circles per simulations by Leo Singer, and you look at galaxy catalogs like the census of the local universe developed by postdoc Dave Cook, uh, then you need to search less than 30 galaxies 
and you have a 50 percent chance of of detecting uh, the true counterpart um, so let's discuss that as well um, in in the discussion hello everybody uh, so I'll also just be talking a little about things I've been personally interested in um, I've been working together uh, with, a, with a number of people from Fermi and LIGO for several years now on uh, connecting gravitational waves to, to the gamma ray transient sky. Uh, in particular, on uh, trying to characterize and detect uh, uh, subluminous uh, short gamma ray bursts. So it was very fulfilling from 1708 17 to see that that was actually a relevant effort, um, you know, compared to the totally reasonable assumption that, that something with the LIGO horizon might be extraordinarily bright. Um, this plot up here has been shown a couple times already. Uh, it just really demonstrates how underluminous um, uh, GRB 1708-17 uh, really was. It was about 30% above the uh, onboard triggering threshold for, for the telescope, um, meaning you know we could have easily missed it uh, if it was just a little further away. Um, and the, the GBM team has been working pretty hard to, uh, to do a deeper offline search uh, rapidly, so rapidly here means within you know an hour plus or so, uh, and there we get about uh, maybe maybe a factor of a few in, in flux sensitivity. So um, we expect you know we don't don't really know where future events will lie, uh, but we can certainly expect some of them will will live you know at or near or slightly below uh, the triggering threshold and, and might be picked up better uh, with an offline search. Um, one of the other things that, that this can provide is, is updated localization. So this is an effort where um, it actually would help to get feedback on what, what the most useful, uh, 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 what the most useful improvement here would be. But this is an example of the, uh, the localization updates for uh, 17017 from uh, the standard localization human in the loop that was uh, published with, uh, along with uh, initial GCNs with the trigger and then also what, what can be obtained when, when doing a little more careful uh, uh, offline analysis. Mostly this uh, systematic improvement here is from, from looking at backgrounds, but we can also uh, uh, get more statistical power and also clean up uh, systematics from the instrumental response. Uh, so the goal here uh, for O3 and LIGO is to, to publish these updated maps uh, along with, or sort of on the same, same time scale as the, the LIGO Virgo triggers uh, and, and they could, for example, uh, be combined and, and if uh, maybe, maybe improve, say, a Hanford-Livingston localization by a factor of about a few. So just ending on a few questions, uh, you know, how, how useful are these, are these maps? Um, I said here, should we focus on speed, depth, or systematics? And I think there's sort of a trade-off here on how we spend our effort. Um, if we focus on depth, that, that cleans up some of the statistical error on these, on these very weak events, maybe going from uh, you know, a few hundred to 100 square degrees. Um, systematics might, might uh, you know, include a better understanding of the instrument response and, and clean up some of the you know, few degree systematic error we have on, on the very brightest of events. Um, I mean, I'm personally interested you know, what, what this low luminosity uh, SGRB distribution turns out to be for, for all these uh, binary neutral star mergers. Um, as, as we gather more events and, and see what it has to tell us about, say, say beaming profiles or any kind of uh, isotopic emission. And then more generally, I, I haven't heard a lot at this conference uh, yet about what the role of, of other survey instruments will be. Of course, Fermi GBM is a survey instrument, so it has a, a somewhat different character than, than all these targeted uh, uh, pointing uh, telescopes. Um, but also, what, uh, there was some discussion about say rapid arc, arc minute localizations, you know, maybe that could be done with a, a wide field soft x-ray survey uh, satellite, uh, and also what will, you know, uh, what we'll get from LSST or SKA with respect to uh, being able to search for orphan afterglow type signals or, or kilonova. The key thing is, as, um, uh, as Phil said, the early time, if you, uh, the key things here are um, uh, trying to get there within the first 10 hours, I think that's, that's, that's a key thing for us as a community to do. Um, the way we worked last time with the GCNs where everyone did has, has been making their um, uh, potential counterparts uh, available publicly, I would encourage us to do that. Um, I'll just point out here, if you look at the first 24 hours, the telescope's going from Chile, then space, then Hawaii, then Australia, space again, South Africa and Chile, so no one group has the ability to take to do that, have that time resolution within the first 24 hours. Uh, so I would encourage us to uh, communicate through the GCNs as we did before, 
Um, if you hold on to your target, which you might do to get the first spectrum and hold on to the thing you think you may get some data before anyone else does, um, you know, realistically, you're not going to be able to get this time. Any single group, and there are some very strong groups here represented, but um, any single group will not be able to get that time resolution um, over the first uh, 24 hours. So I'd encourage us all to work together, particularly just through the GCNs and letting, uh, producing the, um, uh, the, the candidates very rapidly. So the early stage is, 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 the, is the hard bit. The easy bit's between about a day and 10 days. Anybody can do that. Adam could probably do that even. You give him a telescope, right? So the, 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 the more difficult bit then comes after about 10 days when it gets faint uh, and, you, and we are seeing the, uh, the SED move into the near infrared. And so this is gonna be JWST territory. So what's coming out beyond two microns is really an open question which we don't know and that's gonna affect the bolometric luminosity. Um, the binary black hole mergers, um, so I think we haven't, um, uh, this has been a bit ad hoc up until now, and I think we, uh, we do want to quantitatively um, either find a counterpart um, or quantitatively set uh, limits. Um, and this, so this is beginning to become interesting as we get down to the uh, 60 degrees or, or somewhere between tens of uh, square degrees and 100 square degrees. Uh, so I think we either want to do this, so uh, this just gives you an idea. If we want to make a statement that we're uh, 99.3 sigma, uh, three sigma confidence or 99.7 com uh, uh, percent confident that there is no counterpart above a certain flux limit uh, or magnitude during a certain time, then if you're covering about 75 percent of the sky map, you need about five events to do that, uh, to rule that out. So we haven't yet done this in any quantitative way uh, and, it, and we need to think about it. But obviously the flux limit here on Lambda, there's a big range of our facilities that we can do that with and the time period too. So finally, one last thing, what, how are we gonna get organized in the 2020s? Uh, I think we want to use uh, LSST um, to do a targeted search of, of um, error boxes when we're down to a few tens of uh, degrees. It might be a lot more difficult than we found over the last uh, six months, 17, 17 maybe in a fluke. Um, doing the binary black holes, if we don't find anything by then, doing neutron star black hole mergers. I think we need to get organized, though. Um, I think uh, turning LS, um, convincing LSST that they should point at a certain number of LIGO triggers during the um, a year will be, will be um, is not a foregone conclusion. Uh, and I think we should get organized. Uh, the data will be free, will be publicly available if we're um, if we get organized uh, for them to do it, then the data become publicly available to all LSST scientists, that's all US scientists, and those international scientists who have joined. So I think there's an opportunity there and, a, and a, a really an onus on us to get organized and make sure that LSST actually does this. All right, so I will um, hammer on the point about the cosmology challenges and the opportunity, because that's the question I care about the most. <laughs> So um, the motivation for me, at least, for uh, pursuing the challenge of doing precision cosmology with um, these events that we are starting to detect right now, I think it's encapsulated in this figure, which I saw from a Reese et al. paper from 2016. This is showing the latest results for, um, in red is the supernova uh, measurements of H0, in black is uh, results measured via the cosmic micro microwave background, and you can see that they are discrepant from each other, and that was represented earlier in some of the talks by some vertical bars that were not uh, overlapping with each other. Now the key here, other than, well, we want to know the answer, what's the true value of the expansion rate of the universe, but other than that, the importance of this is that this may be our best chance to actually get into what is the physics that's causing the accelerated expansion of the universe. What you're seeing up there, the, the arrows, they are, again, this was a plot made by a person from the supernova community, so the arrows go from CMB to match the supernova results. Um, but you can see by how much the CMB result, the current Planck me measurements, would move towards the uh, supernova results if you were to vary some of the cosmological parameters. For example, the current value of the cosmic, of the uh, equation of state of dark energy from minus one by a, um, a, a 
and or the, you allow the, the value of um, that value not to be constant but to vary with the cosmic time. So that's the WA parameter. So this is important for us because uh, in, I'm in the business of trying to measure and understand the physics of, of, of dark energy. And um, right now, we have a challenge of having all of our cosmological probes being systematic, systematically dominated and, um, and having the issue of trying to disentangle this. And this tension seems to be one of our best opportunities to do it. Now, it's challenging, and I will illustrate this with my second uh, slide here. What I'm showing here in blue is the current best measurements of cosmological parameters from the Dark Energy Survey. And in red is how this parameter space would look like if we added what I expect to be uh, the results from O3. I estimated here something like eight events with a 25% uncertainty in the distance for each event, maybe a little bit over uh, optimistic here and uh, some uncertainty in the peculiar velocities there. And as you can see, this would already improve the parameter space, would shrink a little bit, but it wouldn't really start to make a big of a difference in, uh, uh, in, in many of these cosmological parameters. To do that, we really need to get to precision level of a percent or two. And how quickly are we going to get there? It depends on a number of things. In part, it also depends on our ability as a community to get organized to um, detect, follow up, and analyze as many of, of, of the counterparts as possible. But assuming that we were to find all of them and assuming some projections for the rate of events that have been published by uh, the LIGO collaboration, this is what I, uh, where we could be uh, in the next five years or so, which I think is a good time scale of, uh, I don't know, grants and uh, graduate student lifetimes. And we could be at the level of actually having a, a I wouldn't say competitive measurement. It's, uh, I think it's more than co being competitive, but being complementary, having something to say in the debate of, of the cosmology, uh, cosmological parameters. Lots of, lots of ideas and lots of uh, provocative thoughts about where things are heading. Um, are there any questions from the audience, things that people want to know? Okay. So within LSST, the LSST Science Collaboration, I'm chairing the uh, subgroup that is, uh, uh, has been tasked to try and help design the gravitational wave follow-up for LSST. So I tell you where we are right now. So we have, uh, it seems that there is a possibility, a concrete possibility to get at the level of 1%, few percent time to do TO. Um, uh, on LSST, but it's not set in stone. So we as a community, we have uh, to get together and uh, uh, the real deadline is gonna be at the end of the summer and write a white paper uh, that will reach the LSST um, project and we will have to make the case to give this 1%, let's say 1% of time for TOOs. So, so if there is somebody that is not in my primary or secondary uh, member list and you want to get involved with that and you really want to do some work, please come and talk to me. So, uh, so I have good news. Um, this is on behalf of the LSST Science Advisory Committee and the project. So the battle that's being fought for many years on convincing LSST to do TOs is actually, I mean, successful. Next month, um, I can give you an advance notice, there'll be a call out for white papers on, on changing the LSST observing strategy completely. And this will include changes to the main survey, the special fields, the mini surveys, but it will also explicitly include a call for papers on target of opportunity observations. Uh, these papers will be due in November of 2018, and uh, I think basically LSST has agreed to, to do this. It's just a question of details, how many filters, how many triggers, what sort of observing cadence. So please uh, look, keep your eyes peeled for this call and, and respond actively. So I would like to ask all of you a general question, which um I mean, whenever it's raised, the, the LIGO people keep telling me that it's not helping them much. Uh, the question is, uh, now that we've learned some lessons from the binary neutron star event, uh, can we uh, find uh, additional events of the same type uh, and perhaps go through the LIGO uh, pipeline <coughs> subsequently? And so first identify a population of these uh, also cross-correlated with LIGO. Would you like to comment on that, whether that could lead to a fruitful uh, path to find additional events that were not identified or will, will not be identified unless you tell them? Uh, sure. I, I, I mean, this, when this came up before, uh, we could just take the discussion a little further. Um, so it was brought up that LIGO, LIGO does do externally triggered searches, deep searches, 
targeting the times right around gamma ray bursts, both long and short. So I think I think one of the things that you was going for, and maybe I'll, I'll intervene here for a second, that at least in the gamma rays, it's very easy. You have a very clear signature and a very short timestamp. So you know, you know where it is on the sky, you know that it's a gamma ray burst, and you know that you have a window of a short window. I think it becomes a bit more challenging once you start looking at transients at other wavelengths and trying to go there. So, so I think that's right. If you, so we have been, and I think many, most people running wide field surveys have been looking for um, faint, fast declining transients within about you know, 100 megaparsecs or so, or 150 megaparsecs. Eat, and and there, we have found some candidates. They all turn out to be CVs because they're the contaminating source, really. Um, but the difficulty there is even if we, we it, it, there's usually not good time, um, a, a, a good time stamp as there, is, as there are for GRBs. You might get it within 24 hours, say. And I think my understanding is 24 hours is probably too long to uh, assist LIGO in reducing their. Um, uh, the search window and, and increasing your potential signal to noise. My guess is you're down to, you need hours to minutes, right? So the, the broader question of how could LIGO improve based on information learned from EM, right? You can ask what information can we learn? You could say, okay, well, we've learned about the neutron stars, the equation of state, this type of stuff, could you improve the searches that way? The answer to that is no, because these are very small effects. The gravitational wave problem is different from the EM in that theory has been ahead of the of the observing facilities for many years. We have very, very good models of these gravitational waveforms, particularly for the, for the neutron star systems. You have very accurate models in you know, third, post new, third and a half post-Newtonian that we've known for a long time. So there's not a lot you can do to improve the modeling of the waveforms. Then you can say, can you figure out from EM if you know where on the sky it is, a time constraint, can you do better that way? It turns out for the non-processing systems, for the binary neutron stars with low spin, you don't, as Stephen says, you don't get, other than the GRBs where you know precisely where it is, having a day or so doesn't improve the sensitivity over the all-sky search. There's a very thin shell of, of, uh, um, of events between kind of the five sigma it's really loud in the all-sky search, and it's basically completely buried in the LIGO noise. It's, it's this rapid fall off of the, uh, of the false alarm rate. Because the typical time scales the for, um, the for, for the cadence is, is, you, is around a day. If you're doing wide field surveys around a day, you're doing well. And there, there, is, there is an area you can experience if you have the sky location and you can go back and do a search for systems that are processing where you can dig out more SNR, that will help you. So for neutron star black hole systems, having a sky localization can really help you and pull out more SNR. But for the binary neutron stars, it doesn't help that much. But if, if I may add, um, so uh, despite all of these caveats and challenges, that's not stopping us. Um, we did search the Palma Transient Factory database and found nothing. So that's at a hard upper limit of less than 800 per gigaparsec cube per year of GW170817 like events. And based on that, if, by searching this Wiki Transient facility, I mean, maybe we'll find a few. And if we do, we'll certainly call up our LIGO friends and ask them to search for better or worse <laughs> to see if there's a counterpart. So I mean, I do think, Avi, that's you know, something we should all just keep our eyes peeled for. And even though it's very challenging, as Duncan pointed out, that shouldn't stop us from looking. Yeah. And I think maybe, Phil, do you want to say something about that? Since you mentioned the expected rates in the LSST, we've been talking about the LSST main survey, so I think that kind of falls in. Yeah, exactly. So um, we've been Shortly after 1717, um, Dan Skolnick and I did a study of looking at sort of the numbers of transients in various wide field surveys. And one of them was LSST, where you expect to find um, about 80 year. But the problem is that this is these 80 year are with very, very, very lenient cuts on whether or not you've actually found something. It's just a handful of detections. So I think, as others have said, it's very difficult to actually constrain the light curve behavior back to a point in time and say, look at this point at this time as others have said. So um, these, these, you really need rapid survey. You really need like a targeted survey to do continual rapid follow-up to really see if you can catch things as they go off. I just wanted to remind everyone that like we also have radio detections of neutron star binaries and that also give us a handle on the rate estimates. And it's kind of interesting. I've been working with a grad student on updating the rate estimate based on radio double neutron star systems. And we have several more, which will merge within a Hubble time that have been detected just over the past year. Um, so we can do like a much better job. Um, and it's puzzling because the rate estimates we get are, are much smaller than those rate estimates. Um, 
So the grad student's title of the paper right now is LIGO Got Lucky, <laughs> um, colon. Um, and who knows like, what, what the reason is? I guess I'm just mentioning it that it is another sort of like prior on the expectations. You know, so we take the detections, we put all this survey selection effects in there, and using the current systems, project the merger rate. Um, and so the point is just like that it'll be an interesting next couple of years. Um, because either we don't really understand the selection effects. Vicky's worked on this a lot too, and I think she has something to say. We don't understand the selection effects very well in the radio pulsar surveys, um, or there's another type of system that we're not able to detect in radio surveys that is is out there merging, and for some reason is not not detectable by our radio surveys. But it'll be an interesting picture to see how these like come together. Just just to clarify, <laughs> just to clarify. So you were saying that that the updated new galactic neutron star merger, binary neutron star merger rate is now below the. The last paper we wrote, we predicted like eight to ten per year for advanced LIGO, and that was the number in the abstract. But that was assuming a large horizon distance. That was like 450 megaparsecs. Um, so if we take the current horizon distance, that's like less than one a year. And then the new rate estimate has gone down significantly because even though we found more systems, they're really similar to the current systems, and we've searched a much bigger volume, so the rate estimates have actually gone down a, just a little bit, um, but I think there's a discrepancy. Okay, so, uh, Vicky, I, I don't want to turn this into a debate about rates, but... Uh, no, but, but I mean, Mara, Mara the, I, so I don't, first of all, I don't think that we totally misunderstand the selection effects in rates. Uh, in binary pulsar rates, uh, but the big uncertainties there are the luminosity function for the radio for pulsars sure, yeah. and the beaming factor, okay? These are yep. the two things. Uh, so in terms of the rate density, uh, what we knew from the mid-2000s is actually exactly on top of, the, uh, of what the LIGO rate is coming out with. Now, uh, you can still adjust, I, I mean, I can't believe you're coming up with rates now that are well below the LIGO rate, because you always have that uncertainty in the luminosity function. So I'm curious. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm they're not well below, just there's sort of one a year is consistent. The, the current one is consistent. But anyway, I don't want to take too much time on this. I just wanted okay. to we'll look, look forward to point the paper. it out. Yeah. So uh, I was thinking about the distance inclination issue and, and getting that. And so Lindley might remember the answer. So when you, so there's a few ways uh, that you might hope to break that degeneracy. Unfortunately, one of them isn't gonna work for neutron stars because the additional harmonics depend on the mass ratio. So you need a, a mass, you know, and unfortunately neutron stars come with the same masses. You're not gonna get like you know, two to one, three to one mass ratio. So you're not going to get it from the harmonics. But uh, the other, the other thing you can get is if you have multiple different detectors, they not only give you better triangulation, they also give you multiple projections of the polarization pattern. And because plus and cross come with different factors of the inclination, that will improve your measurement of inclination. What I just don't remember from those papers, looking at the network of detectors. Uh, and that's why I'm asking maybe Lindley if he remembers, you know, you see those plots of how the sky localization improves, but how does the inclination determination improve once you've got those multiple projections of the uh, antenna pattern? I just can't remember how it worked. Yeah, pro probably some of the audience does the answer exactly, but I think it would improve quite a lot. And, and as, you, as you mentioned, uh, you know, we get the degree of circular polarization from, from the polarization that tells you the orientation. Uh, Peter yeah. mentioned, I just wanted to say, so, you, you, you see the, the posteriors already, the inclination. Uh, there's not too much of a signal from Virgo and, and Hanford and Livingston are very co-aligned. Right. So just adding one misaligned detector should, should help a lot. Well, unfortunately, it's, it's really hard. I mean, if you're close to on, on axis, it looks circularly polarized. And if you're 20, 30 degrees off axis, it still looks circularly polarized. And so if you know the distance, I mean, the distance, um, uh, if you have, like, have identified the counterpart, then, then you get a better handle on the inclination. But just from the polarization content, the, the way of arriving at Earth is, you know, circular polarized to one or a few percent up to angles of 45 degrees or something like that. But I was just going to say, if the, if the amplitude's also going to second order, it's not going to, to matter in the same way, right? They, maybe they're both not so sensitive. If what? The if the amplitude, the 
standard siren amplitudes also going to second order. I just wanted to point out that um, for a precision cosmology program where we are accumulating hopefully uh, dozens or, or tens of events, um, I think that we can mitigate this issue by requiring in the cosmology analysis, in the likelihood analysis for cosmological parameters, um, we can con uh, impose a constraint that the total distribution of viewing angles be random because we don't expect any particular preferred viewing angle. I think that that might be, um, let's say, an another level. Currently, the level of analysis that was done for the uh, GW170817 didn't include this because obviously we have only one event. And maybe in 03, it will be also too early because I don't expect we will have that many. But once we get to the level of trying to get to the percent level precision, I think that might be uh, a viable way to do it with avoiding having to. Um, to get into a circular argument, for example, for now I know the counterparts and now I can constrain the viewing angle and et cetera. Maybe it's a very short question with a short answer. Are we ever going to know where the merging black holes are? Well, I think you're right, only if there is a, a detection at, at another wavelength. So, I mean, I think we haven't done it systematically, even with the, with the, few, with the few events. So I suspect, there's certainly no um, several groups, I, I suspect uh, ZTF will do it. At all. I, I would think every, all of the, all of the binary black hole events which are, which have sky localizations below about 100 square degrees, I think they will get atten attention from the, from the community across a number of wavelengths. But when you apply the, the distance estimate, um, and then you weed out the normal, the, you're, you're mostly dominated by 1A supernovae. So looking for things which are not, not normal supernovae within that volume is not... No, correct. We're, we're, we're looking for something which is not, not clearly a supernova within the volume. Then if it, does, if it is detectable, I think removing the background is not the difficult thing. It's, 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 it's really, well, something which is not a supernova, not an obvious, <laughs> not an obvious variable star. Uh, if they're in the cores of galaxies, then they're difficult because they, you know, cores of galaxies vary quite a bit. But we're, we're just looking for something which is an, an unusual, which is really what we did for 1708-17. No, we don't know at all, but we will look. I can add one um, piece of, because this is one of the analyses that we are doing right now in, for GW170814. Um, so this was the binary black hole merger that happened, and it happens to be in the DES footprint where we have uh, very good um, data for it. Um, so although that analysis is not yet complete or published, but um, just uh, to give you an idea. So what we do is exactly what was described in terms of um, trying to reject all of the known um, um, non-background, right? And you make an estimate with um, simulations and you put fakes in the area, et cetera, and you say, okay, based on these observing conditions, I expect to have this many background events. And then you open the box and you look how many you have and you can statistically say, okay, there is an, a probability that there is something there. But that is not telling you exactly where the counterpart is, what, what I expect that this type of analysis will tell us over time, again, we need more events and accumulate at least a half a dozen of events as well observed as GW170814. But in that case, what we can tell is, um, for example, if we continue to see nothing, if everything is consistent with background, we can say if there are optical counterparts to these events, those counterparts must be fainter than magnitude blah, a number. Right, and from there, then I think our theory colleagues can uh, uh, work out their magic to tell us if there are um, plausible counterparts, etc. And then we can redesign our searches to look for counterparts that way. So I think it will be a, a back and forth that will take a long time until, uh, unless if, if we get truly lucky, uh, it will be a go back and forth that will take some time. I have a change in the topic slightly. I have a question for the M observer. So. It is, it is technically possible for LIGO and Virgo to get out immediately reasonable estimates of the masses and spins of the, of the detections. So Neil and I were talking about this yesterday. I, I reran the search um, uh, using just the template of bank search on the, on the events from, uh, from the LOSC data and the, the M1, M2 chi effective that come out are very close to the, the final values. They can be produced immediately. And Neil thinks, and I agree with him, that you know, a, an hour or so of PE can refine those pretty well. So it's technically possible to get those numbers out. So they could appear in the open alerts if LIGO and Virgo chose to do that. Maybe the EM folks on the panel could comment on how would that help you guys do the follow-up and the observing so people can hear kind of how that would help 
do better science with the, with the follow-up rather than just, we want the numbers, give us the precious numbers. I was going to say, um, I think in, in terms of informing uh, observing strategy, one thing that would be useful is if we can um, figure out if it was a neutron star, binary neutron star, or a neutron star black hole, if you can make that distinction, because that quantitatively sort of changes sort of the expected uh, ejected property, so that could inform uh, search decisions, things like that would, would matter. I, mean, I, th I think you'll, you'll find just the investment of time and energy and uh, telescope time um, goes up rapidly. Uh, the more information that you can provide, and it doesn't have to be very quantitative, but you're telling us, um, I think you are going to tell us whether or not you ex you, it's a, it, it, the probability contains a neutron star. Um, but even, as I previously proposed, masses to one significant figure would be useful for us. Um, and it's just the motivation to actually invest uh, the time because some projects are, are not limited by um, time, but they're usually the shallower facilities which are inexpensive and probably have the least chance of, uh, of finding something. Um, so the more expensive facilities and the, 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 the more powerful facilities, um, we, we will be looking for, we will be making decisions about which events to follow up. So the more information you can provide, the more motivation we would have to do it in a an optimized way. I think that's true for everyone. Yeah. What is the kind of false alarm rate? We, we know that we have discussed this before <laughs> the first detections. Now that those detections have been made, what kind of false alarms are you willing to accept and follow up? How much garbage do you want for each real <laughs> event? Is every, is every, everyone could give a number here each, I guess. Um, but, uh, and so the, so the question is, what's the false alarm rate that we would accept to follow up? So if they give us an event and they say, well, it's only 20% chance it's real, would we, would we uh, follow it up? Um, so um, I, I, personally, from the, from the wide field surveys um, that you have to invest time and trigger, I think we're at probably 80% level. If it's 80% chance, of 80, between 80 and 90% chance of being real, we would do it. Below that, I probably wouldn't, because they're likely to be the ones with larger sky areas. So, you know, why chase something which is 2,000 square degrees and has an 80% chance of being real? I think that the answer also depends on what type of resources you're going to invest. So, for example, a team that is uh, working perhaps with a smaller telescope and that is cheaper for them to, uh, uh, a smaller aperture telescope that is cheaper for them to, to to invest the resources, they may have different threshold than somebody working on a, a four-meter telescope and so on. So that's, that's one thing. So I think more important than having a hard threshold of any type is having uh, associated with each candidate a number so that each team can make their own use their own judgment to evaluate what they're going to do. And sometimes the same team can use different strategies for events of different uh, level of confidence and, 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 and so on. So it's hard to say exactly one number. Brian? Yeah, I just wanted to comment also on, on Duncan's statement about a question about having more information. Because as I talked about in, in my talk, I think we expect that my, my guess should be that the total mass of the binary you know, can have a big effect on the counterpart. And even you know, a small change in that could produce qualitative differences. So I think, you know, I think in this next run, I think everyone will follow up the next neutron star merger, no question. You know. But if we start seeing, you know, example five or six and they're all identical and they all have the same chirp masses we would like to know whether seven is different or you know <laughs> you know to, to, at some point i think the groups that are that have the heavy resources are going to want to know what's special about this relative to the samples that have accumulated so far and i don't know when we'll reach that i don't think it will be immediately but i think there has to be a dynamic strategy for you know yeah and once we know more about the a few of these events we will also be able to tune the strategy for example if we know that more massive systems tend to have more emission in one band than another, you may choose to invest more time in that particular band for that particular event than the other. So, but I think we are far away from that. Right now, it's, uh, yeah, I agree. We're far away from now, <laughs> but I mean, if, if we turn on 03 and there's you know, 20 events, we could very quickly get to that era. And, <laughs> and Safia's question and my question are not decoupled, right? Because you might say, if the masses and spins tell me that this is a new neutron star black hole binary with a highly spinning black hole, which is a 50% chance of being real, you might invest more effort in that than a 100% fifth binary neutron star we've seen in 2018. Actually, this is not a very urgent question, but if you can think of LISA, uh, we also know that LISA can actually tell you in advance 
at least for the most massive black hole mergers, uh, possibly weeks or even uh, months in advance, where it will be on the sky to some degree precision. So you could actually be looking for uh, precursors, not just afterglows. Probably not an urgent discussion item, but this is something to keep in mind. Um, I wanted to, to bring the discussion back um, to question number two. So we heard from Rafaela that for 170817, which is an event at 40 megaparsecs, so very nearby, uh, the X-ray to detect it in the X-rays and radio requires investments of hours and hours. I think the last X-ray observation was almost 27 hours of staring at one known position. And so my question is if we have events at 200 megaparsecs, maybe even beyond, and we don't see optical counterparts, what are the prospects for finding an X-ray or radio counterpart, uh, let's put aside gamma rays for a second, as the way of identifying, rather than using X-rays and radio to follow up the known, exact known position. So. Um, so I would say actually, I mean, radio is quite the most promising of the remaining wavelengths, uh, because uh, the, the very large array is, has now exquisite sensitivity. And um, as I was mentioning, if you do a simulation of of the sensitivity of LIGO and Virgo in the next observing run, half the events will, be, will have a localization volume less than 10 to the 4 megaparsec cube, uh, which means that they will have, you have to look at less than 30 galaxies um, to identify a radio counterpart, assuming that you know, the optical, infrared, gamma rays, everything else has failed, and you have no information about localization. If you just target the 30 most uh, massive or most star-forming galaxies in the error circle, um, you can do this about half the events in O3. So I, I do think that's a very credible strat search strategy, which is very much within the feasibility reach of um, the next observing run with the very large array. I think that's assuming that the counterparts will be much brighter, much more luminous, uh, um, right? so to even be detectable. But um, yeah. A slightly general comment. That obviously, people from the LSE are here and are listening to the conversation about the kinds of things that observers would like to hear um, and like to know about what we're, we're seeing. And be between the town halls that we held in Amsterdam and Cambridge a little while ago, this kind of thing, and of course, any place where this kind of conversation takes place, we're, we're taking notes. Um, and we're, we're pulling them back into the discussion within the LSE to try and find out what we can do to find this right compromise between, well, making sure that we don't let any science be lost. That's clearly the most critical thing. You know, if there's something that requires a, a, a that could profit from observers, and we can supply the information that's needed to do that. We've got to do that. This more delicate matter of helping to make choices between limited observing time is, of course, a lot trickier to know, you know what kinds of things are useful, but the, oh, the, the, the mass to one significant digit, that kind of thing, that sounds, that's a nice, actionable approach to being able to bring out information that we can be pretty confident of, allows, um, us to maintain some of our proprietary data so that we can get some science out ourselves, but without either depriving you all of the chance of following things up or handicapping you unnecessarily. So keep on talking and let, and let us know if there are things. You can write me, David Shoemaker, an email or anybody you know in the LSC, and we'll, we, we, will, we won't lose the, the ideas. Thanks. I, I just wanted to uh, say that on, on the European side, uh, there is a wide field X ray mission, Theseus, that has been selected as a, I guess, uh, yesterday or so for, for study. So on the European side, they are going on the wide, wide field X rays. Do you know the Theseus? Theseus, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. So at time, I, yeah, I was actually checking online because I'm part of the, of the science team, but I don't remember. I should check. It's, well, it's not, sele it's not selected, it's, it's selected it's, for it's study. It's a study. It's study. Either way, so it's not imminent. Uh, yeah. But, uh, okay. uh, yeah, Josh. So, yeah, I wanted to turn the discussion back to what we as a community should be doing for our upcoming decadal survey, which uh, some of you will have heard may be delayed, but in fact I've just gotten an email this morning that it probably won't be. Um, in any case, it's coming soon. A number of us have been thinking about a new and dedicated space telescope, which already sounds expensive, but this could be done at much less cost than uh, a Hubble, and that is what NASA is also considering for uh, a major consideration in the decadal survey, a probe-class mission. And this is something we're calling the Time Domain Spectroscopic Observatory, TSO which would be in a very novel orbit, a geostationary orbit over LSST. That tells you something immediately about what it could do on very short follow-up timescales. But it also 
in an orbit like that has access to 80% to 85% of the sky immediately. So you don't have the, all the constraints we have on the ground. And operating it cold at 100 degrees Kelvin, which, it can, which studies that we've had done have shown is very easy to do, just radiative cooling, this is remarkably sensitive and so can extend all the way from 0.5 to 5 microns and do uh, an incredible range of science. So for those who are interested in helping think about this, let me know. Uh, we're planning a workshop here in late, uh, probably in December. But that, um, that is something just to get back to the general point that I think we uh, should really be pushing for. This is the era of time domain astronomy, astrophysics, and big decisions are going to be made. One other quick comment on the wide field X-ray imaging front, which is necessary for getting triggers for uh, binary neutron stars and black hole uh, neutron star systems. There are ways of doing that at much higher sensitivity, broader band, and higher spatial resolution than what we're used to. And that's something that we're here in my group at Harvard are working hard on for a constellation of small sats, small satellites, very inexpensive, 10 arc second source positions, 10 times the sensitivity of SWIFT over the 2 to 200 kV band. So this is uh, a major step forward if we can do this on an Explorer class mission budget, which requires further study but looks promising. So I'm just mentioning that there are, you know, some bold new initiatives that we should all be thinking about. Excellent. Any final questions? We have about two minutes left. So, so just on, on that, Josh, a, a reason why you, don't, you wouldn't go below 5,000, can you go from the UV, um, UV through to uh, five microns? You could. <coughs> Yes, in principle you could. That, that hasn't been studied, but there's no reason not to. It just makes the mission and the somewhat more expensive. And this is very much a cost constrained project. But yes, the answer is it could be done. Okay, excellent. So I want to thank all of you and especially the panel members for a lively discussion. Thank you very much.